Good morning, and thank you all for joining us for the Understanding Lay Retirement Readiness webinar. I am your host, Jermaine Hathaway, and this is the actual webinar. I will now be turning it over with no further ado to our presenters. Take it away, team. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Ann Hurst, Assistant Manager of Church Research, and we'll be sharing some findings today from the Lay Retirement Readiness Webinar Study. Not the webinar study. Uh, with me is are my colleagues Matthew Price and Grace Longo. Please introduce yourselves. I'm Matthew Price. I'm Senior Vice President for Research and Data here at the Church Pension Group. And I'm Grace Longo, and I am a Financial Education Specialist. Wonderful. So we will just dive into our results. Thank you for joining us. So let me talk about who we are and what we do. Um, we are the uh, research and data group at the Church Pension Group. And as a result of that position, we collect a lot of data, um, particularly as a benefits administrator. We get a lot of demographic data, employment data, compensation data. Um, also for the clergy, we're the recorder of ordinations. So that gives us all of the data about clergy coming in, also clergy retiring, and the various moves that clergy make. Um, we don't have data at this point on um, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. People do ask us about differences around that. Um, that's not data that we currently possess. Um, but I think for the clergy, there are sort of moves in that direction. Um, but for today, we're just gonna concentrate on really the, the left-hand section, which is our work as a benefits administrator, particularly the data we have on lay employees. So Anne, why don't you talk about what we're gonna do today? So we're gonna talk about a large-scale comprehensive study we did last year on lay employees. And we really just wanna to communicate to all of you what we learned from that study. So we don't collect data for the sake of hoarding it, we collect it so that we can learn and then communicate our findings back out to you, our clients. So we're gonna talk about who we learned lay employees are, what lay employees' financial circumstances are, and what contributes to lay retirement readiness and lay retirement confidence. Okay, great. So one of the things that we see out there in the world is, um, and, and, and when you watch the news or any financial channel or read the financial pages, you may see this, that um, we're, the, the nation as a whole is reaching, moving towards this, this real crisis in terms of retirement readiness. So, um, a lot of the um, employer plans have um, that used to offer people sort of guaranteed income have have disappeared, um, and 40% of the population has no real retirement plan at all, and many people have very very small amounts in their defined contribution um, plans. People are living longer. Um, healthcare costs are going up, and at the same time, um, you know, at some point, unless the government acts, there will be a shortfall in terms of Social Security. Social Security will not be able to make full payments um, to recipients as of about 2035, and also Medicare will start to shift an increasing proportion of its costs over to the recipients because it too will not have um, enough money and that could occur as soon as the middle of the next decade. Um, but on top of that also, um, Grace, we know that people have a lot of extra financial burdens around things like education um, and other financial issues. How are people sort of dealing with that and how does that impact people as well as they, in terms of 
what this is going to look like as people move closer to retirement? Well, the problem is that um, many people are taking on debt for their college, for their children's college education or their own. And the debt really can be a stumbling block in saving for uh, retirement. There's also a lot of health, because of healthcare costs being so high, there is now medical debt. Um, so these things need to be addressed in a um, coherent way so that they can save for retirement and still deal with those debts. Now, the good thing is that back in 2009, um, the, the church um, decided to um, make the lay employee system, uh, the lay employee pension system mandatory. Uh, we have, a, you know, over 90% of the employers have complied with this. Most people are close to, the, the latest data shows that people are close to a 13% savings rate. Um, and the other part of it is, is that most of our medical plans um, operated by the, the medical trust tend to be more uh, generous. They're on the gold or platinum side. Um, and as a result, the, the enormous sort of co-pays and deductibles that you see in other plans, which is part of what Grace was talking about, don't tend to occur. So that um, uh, the, the um, denominational health plan was also passed in 2009. So we do feel that the church made important decisions then um, to say that everyone had to be covered. And so um, the employees, the lay employees of the Episcopal Church are in a better place and are better positioned to face this upcoming crisis than many other employees. But nevertheless, um, as we'll see, there is much that can be done. So this is a, a look at what happened to the assets of the lay DC plan. As you can see, um, they have gone up over 200% since we passed the uh, legislation. And that's a combination of two things. Um, the 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 savings rate um, for employees was around when we started in 2009, about seven and a half percent. As I say, that's now close to 13. Um, we have more people inside the plan and um, the, obviously the markets as well have gone up um, quite a lot since that time. So we've had a, a generally sort of, this is a, a, a good news story in terms of what is happening, obviously more to do, but um, I think that the church can be proud of the work that it did back in 2009. And Matthew, can you define for our attendees, define the DC plan? What the that DC means? plan is the defined contribution plan. So we have two plans. We have a DB plan, um, which is a fixed 9% um, uh, that that goes into that plan and some employees have that in addition some have a, a, a DC plan um, but we also have most of our employees who are uh, with us in a DC plan and that is where the employer makes a a five percent sort of all all people get a five percent um, but then there's a match, uh, and that match is um, a minimum of 4% that the employer will give if the employee also puts in that 4%, and that comes up to 13% altogether. And all of those um, are, that is the minimum amount. Obviously, you know, um, employers can put both match more or put more into the base, but they minimally have to put in a 5% base and a 4% match. So um, while we're very happy about this progress, we do see that people are making lower contributions at younger ages. And particularly, you know, our lay population does tend to be more female. Particularly, we see the lowest contributions amongst um, young women. Grace, why are these younger age contributions so important? 
Well, it's, um, it's a very important concept called compounding. So the more time you have, the less money you actually have to put in. But if you are not contributing at least the match, the 4%, you are leaving money on the table. And so that is an important thing to try to accomplish is at least putting in the match. Right. From when you're right from when you're beginning work. As, star as yeah. soon as you can start. Yeah. And Grace, what is the new fidelity recommendation for percent contributions? 15%. 15%. And that is a combination of employer and employee money. Yeah. So we are we're slowly getting there, mm -hmm. um, but it will be it will be good to to get there if, uh, earlier on. So, in light of all of that context, both kind of in the national retirement circumstances, but also specific circumstances for retirees, we wanted to fill in some gaps of what we didn't know. So we did a survey and also ran some focus groups. So we reached out to lay employees with a pension product with us, offered a charitable giving incentive to take the survey. And let me tell you, you guys love a charitable donation to an Episcopal organization and we got a 20% response rate so we feel really good about being able to generalize what we have found out from the survey. And then to dig even deeper into what's going on in terms of the thought processes and emotions behind retirement planning and savings, we did three different focus groups kind of geographically dispersed to get a sense of lay employees experience on the ground, as it were. So who are lay employees? So we found out some demographic things from the, um, the survey, and we have about a median age of 51. The majority of lay employees, at least of the respondents, and we know this to be true of our internal data from benefits, is that they're female. 58% uh, of respondents identified as Episcopalian, two-thirds are currently married with 37% reporting that they have a dependent at home for whom they're financially responsible, and a lot of smarty pants on our hands, so three-quarters of the respondent population has a bachelor's degree or higher education than that. We also asked about your work experience. So 73% uh, had been employed outside of the Episcopal Church prior to their current position. And of those, only 17% are, are receiving or will receive some kind of retirement benefit from their previous career. And we had kind of the top five industries sending uh, to the Episcopal Church and we find that lay employees are really apt for the job. So business and consulting, certainly finance, education and teaching, nonprofit, our musicians and our artists uh, in terms of performance and music. And then finally also medicine and health professionals. And I think that this will really make sense when we talk about what is meaningful to lay employees about working for the church. Which is that many lay employees see their work as a ministry. So, you know, they may not be ordained, but there's a sense of contributing to a higher purpose, contributing to a sense of service. And that that's really important in terms of valuing where you work and keeping you there. Um, appreciating that it's not profit driven and, you know, wanting to help, wanting to be of service. And those values that lay employees talked about keeping them in the job, we find that that's really true. 50% of lay employees in the study reported that they are working in the church for more than 11 years. So, these lay employees have spent over a decade in service to the church, which may dispel some maybe previous anecdotal ideas that lay employees kind of have a more temporary nature in this line of work. 
So again, it's that sense of walking away and feeling blessed, knowing that the community you work with is kind and nice and generous and valuing the Episcopal Church and their practices. That's what, that's what is keeping lay employees, regardless of Episcopal identity or not, working in the church. So what about their work lives? We asked what roles, so this is, I'll throw a term out there, mutually exclusive. We asked which role best identifies your job. And so one third of them uh, of lay employees describe their role as an administrator and then uh, musicians, financial administrators, which is a little distinct, uh, assistants and of course teachers. Uh, and yet, um, there are so many more responsibilities. So lay employees are really wearing a lot of hats. So two thirds of lay employees report more than one main responsibility for their work life. So we see a lot of picking up with office administration, communications, financial administrations, uh, certainly facilities and um, in our line of work, the benefits administration. So when I talk to lay employees in Baton Rouge and Seattle and Cincinnati, you know, we, we, we talked about what their lives look like on a day-to-day -day basis. And there is a lot of energy around what the work is. It's a lot of problem solving and meetings some putting out of fires. But there are all these, also these other elements about the community, the relationships that you build, a sense of family, a sense of gratitude with your working community. And then there is also the spirituality component. Again, that sense of service and mission and pastoral care, even if you're not the clergy person, you're still providing that kind of care to the people in your community. So that's all about the day, like what is the day about? But because we provide the benefits for lay employees, we wanted to get a sense of what component the benefits play into your working experience. So we asked if you thought that they were generous. So with respect to retirement benefits, 85% of respondents said that they are absolutely generous, 82% for healthcare, and then slightly less the ancillary benefits. And by that, we mean life insurance, disability, kind of the, the extra benefits that you get in a package. And there were themes, we also asked why, why did you feel that way? And there are themes around that and a huge theme, and I, this gets back to the context for lay employees with the mandatory pension and health systems is that there's a great appreciation for having what lay employees have, especially in comparison to their neighbors, their friends, previous employment that they've experienced. They feel that um, what is provided to them from the Episcopal Church is so much more generous than what is out there in the general market. Um, for those, for the proportion, the smaller proportions that felt they're not generous, it's kind of just that the, these are the benefits that people should have. Um, so it's not necessarily that they're generous, they're, they're standard. And there is some comparison also. So you compare to your other coworkers, maybe you feel that the clergy person at your parish gets more than you do. And so those were some of those themes that come up in terms of feeling feeling a sense of generosity from the benefits package or not. I also think that it partly depends on, you know, your also one's, uh, when you join the church and then what your previous employer was like. I mean, we do, you know, people who, you work somewhere for a long time and then you think back of, oh, well, you know, my previous employer had X benefits, but your previous employer might have had X benefits 15 years ago. That but employer not may yeah. not have. It. So it's it's always difficult when comparing sort of what you're thinking about mm -hmm. to are you comparing it really now to now or is it now to some sort of past point that. Um, Absolutely. So. I'd also bring up, too, that in terms of um, a theme for both generosity and you know, non-generosity was cost. So for those that 
felt that the benefits were generous, they really appreciated the employer match, the employer contributions, the percent contributed to healthcare. But for those that felt that it wasn't generous, even though those same circumstances are true, benefits in the United States have been increasing in cost. And so there's still a financial burden that they provide yeah. that the lay employees are experiencing. And so those are some of those themes, mm -hmm. comparatively and cost. Right. Yeah. So because benefits are quite a big deal, you know, I heard both from the survey and from the focus groups that employees just need more help making benefit choices. Sometimes a parish is small and the the person on the ground to help you make those choices isn't an HR professional. Um, you know, sometimes I heard one story where this is just what everyone had, and so I'll choose what everyone else has, even if that's not necessarily the right health plan or right contribution level. Right, so we don't always have the HR professionals available to us. Um, and as Matthew said, it depends on when you joined the Episcopal Church. We've had a decade of the mandatory lay pension system, but as we saw, there are a lot of employees that have worked for the church for much longer than that. So Matthew, what about compensation? Well, if we look at um, compensation, we see that, um, you know, we, we have a, um, a median compensation that actually when we compare it um, to what we see in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they have a category of religious workers, and it's religious workers who are not clergy, um, because that's its own category. And we see that there's a compensation that's around 40,000 a year. And so we're pretty close to, um, you know, the, the benchmark for that. Now, I mean, to the point, our clergy are slightly paid better than the national average for clergy across all denominations. Our lay employees tend to be standard. I think that's partly due to um, the way in which sort of differing labor markets work. Um, so the, the compensation is, is, you know, good, but obviously, you know, can be better. It's still not for a median of around 40,000, depending on where you live. You know, that's not, nobody's saying that people are going into this or the money definitely for the sense of service um, that they have. So we do see differences in compensation, um, like a, you know, not just the clergy, but um, across society, uh, men tend to get paid more than women. Um, married people tend to be uh, more highly compensated. Um, region has um, an effect with people at the coast getting more. Um, obviously, compensation goes up with education level, and um, dioceses uh, are uh, people have higher compensation than in parishes. And Episcopalians, and partly also because I think they they tend to work for longer for the church, have a higher compensation than non-Episcopalians. So obviously, you know, as uh, we said, people don't do it for the money, but always, you know. Um, more would be good. And in some ways, as we see, you know, that like um, like sort of government service sometimes or nonprofits, um, benefits are good, but, you know, overall compensation is often modest. So let's talk about the financial health of our lay employees. So, sure, no, you go ahead then. Well, so, and I am sure Matthew and, and Grace have plenty to contribute on this slide also, but we asked in the survey, what kind of financial habits do you have? And we're seeing a lot of really great habits. You know, 71% say that they save on a regular basis, 68% um, with a budget, two thirds have researched how to save for their future. So they're, even if they're not saving all the time, there's engagement on how to save. Um, but the, the 
One thing that I also want to point out, though, is we see two thirds having non mortgage debt. So debt that's not related to an asset like a house or, or a condo or something. Yeah. And that, you know. Yeah. And so that's, that's a big impact. Yes. as Because then um, at that level, particularly if it's either, I mean, you then one is making decisions between money to put aside to pay off debt versus money to pay to put aside for other things and that always adds some level of 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 uh, stress for people when having to make those decisions grace do these numbers feel about right from your experience and your research mm -hmm. um these are actually right on par with the national averages. Um, and it's fantastic that they have such good uh, financial habits. And if you are doing all these things and still not having the outcome um, that you would like to see, that would be a good time to call us or have someone else review what you're doing to help tweak and enhance the way you use your budget or a rainy day fund or any of these things that you have listed. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think that one of the things that we see through the research um, that has been done um, <clears throat> by the Aspen Institute, by the Federal Reserve Project on uh, Microeconomics, I mean, there's a whole set of different uh, um, research bodies that have looked at the instability of expenses so that now, particularly with high deductible medical plans, um, there's a tendency where you know the bumps in the road um, can really throw people off. And so it might be, again, it might be a medical copay, it might be something goes wrong with the car, um, a home repair, things that um, make it very hard for people to achieve their goal. Um, and, and that, again, is something that is, is challenging. Savings rates historically have gone downwards. They've gone downwards from about 1970 through until the recession. They went up again during the recession, but they've now gone back down um, closer to 3 to 4%. And so that has made um, it more challenging for people to have those kind of cushions where they can absorb some of these bumps in the road as they go along. So all of this creates kind of a financial landscape of where lay employees are with their work and their finances. And so what does it look like when we look into the future for retirement readiness? Matthew? So um, the Employee Benefits Research Institute asked this question about whether or not uh, people are uh, confident and ready for retirement. Um, and it's, you know, the question is always, do you feel confident that you will have enough money uh, to support yourself in retirement? And you can see that um, if we look at LA employees who are the, the purple group, um, people aren't um, about, it's really about 50-50. It's about half are either somewhat or very confident, um, but a number, almost a quarter are not at all confident and, and you know, another over a quarter are not too confident. Um, so it's a very mixed picture. It is slightly less, not quite as good as the rest of the U.S. population um, and not as good as the comparative group that we have, which is clergy, where we ask the same question. Um, the one thing I will say is that it is an improvement on when we ask the same question in um, during our preparation, uh, this was back in 2007, so before the recession, um, we asked this question uh, in a survey that we did of all lay employees at the time prior to um, the, the lay pension plan being made mandatory. And there it wasn't 50-50, you know, most people were on the not confident side. So we have in the church increased people's level of confidence, retirement security, but 
Not as much as um, obviously we would like. We'd at least like to hit those national benchmarks in terms of retirement confidence. I just want to say um, this isn't really surprising um, when I look at survey data on women particularly mm -hmm. and since we have such a large uh, population of women, women self-report that they are not confident about retirement, they're not confident about managing their retirement dollars. So that may be a reason why you see some of these numbers. Um, there are you know, many things that can be done to help build confidence. You are all successful people. You are all doing all kinds of jobs that require multitasking and lots of different experience. When people talk about managing their retirement dollars, somehow that becomes very scary and very daunting. And with help, um, and as we've seen that, we, you know, employees want this help, we can help you build that confidence so that you can have the retirement that you want. That's a very interesting point because as you know, as um, Anne said, 71% of our respondents were female. And yes, there's that. And also I believe that um, studies show, well, that when people are asked about how much they know about finances, that males report a higher level of confidence about knowing, but when they ask them very specific questions, um, the male, male and female respondents score about the same. The difference is just on whether or not they think that they know the answers, not actually right. knowing it. So I think the confidence part, you're right, might be um, that. But again, so we would love to um, push, you know, have those um, right-hand columns uh, go up a little bit more. Well, and as you say, Matthew, when we look at what are the contributing factors to financial wellness, confidence in retirement, we see that gender effect, that uh, our male respondents were more confident. If you're in a partnership and there's you know, arguably two incomes, you're more confident. The older you are, the, the more your confidence increases. Certainly education level, as we saw with compensation, and as well compensation and then you know a big lever in terms of your sense of confidence that you can retire is not owing debt mm. yeah it's the amount of debt that people have yeah so i asked uh we asked people when do you see yourselves retiring and a lot of the answers we got back from the open text was, you know, when I'm 100, take me out on a stretcher, you know, not feeling like you actually can retire financially, even if you want to. Um, and so we asked that open text question, but we also uh, asked response, respondents to say what, you know, at what age categories they anticipate and only 12% thought that they would retire before 65, so pretty low. And a third said that they were planning to work to 72 or later. Is this a realistic expectation, Matthew? Well, I mean, the median retirement age, the median age at which people take Social Security in the U.S. is still 62. So still, most yeah. people are still retiring at a very early age. What we do see are... Um, we do see more people working beyond 65. That's certainly a rapidly growing group in part because this is the baby boomer group and so it's just larger. And so you would expect some expansion that tends to be on, for employees who have high levels of education, maybe don't have jobs that are so, that, that create health, health issues, so they're not manual labor jobs. Um, but health is the big issue that, that prevents people from working longer, even if they plan to, yeah. um, then both health and you know, actually being able to find a job um, at that age, I think, are the issues. So I would say that it, it is not um, realistic to plan to work past 72. Obviously, the longer you can delay taking Social Security, 
the larger your social security check will be. Um, I can't remember what the formula is, but there is some amount that you get yeah. extra for each year delay. Eight percent. Wow. So <laughs> that's with taking no risk. So deferring is always a better strategy if you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, according to the Social Security uh, Administration, they say that 86% of people in the United States are ready for retirement at age 70. Mm -hmm. That any age below that, it's substantially less um, retirement ready. You mean financially ready? Financially ready. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So working to 70, if you can do it and you have the health, that you know can be a great plan. Right. I think Matthew just changed his plan when you said 8%. No, exactly. No, that's that's dramatic. And we actually also will we'll talk about, I think we have some resources on that too, to talk mm -hmm. about Social Security for people. But So, you know, our lay employees reported that it may be a, quite a long time before they intend on retiring, but they are looking forward to it. You know, and, and even if their dreams are modest, you know, no golden toilets, but a healthy life, you know, living well, you know, indulging in in interests and, you know, lay employees are responsible for so much that just taking a nice breather sounds really good. Um, and again, we, we have a lot of service oriented you know, talent around the church and, you know, there's energy to keep doing that. And this one always gets me that, you know, wanting to enjoy those later years, but not have to work at Walmart, um, which is, I think, a, a fair sentiment. So how do, how do we bridge that gap between feeling like you can never retire versus you know, looking forward to it and wanting to it to be comfortable enough financially. And so as we've kind of touched on already, you know, lay employees reported being a little overwhelmed or intimidated by the topic and had a desire for one on one discussions. Uh, you know, one person said they'd, they'd rather go to the dentist than deal with this. And the other, you know, another person just acknowledged even if they're engaging in the topic, it's just hard to know what is actually enough. Grace, do, does this ring true for you with your experiences with our clients? Absolutely. I, I, I can't tell you how many people say that, you know, I'll never retire. Um, it's going to be 100. But when we actually look at the numbers and we look at, um, so this is what happens in a one-on-one. -on -one. First of all, it's confidential. There is no sales. Um, it is directed at you and what your situation is. Um, we cannot give investment advice. We can't give product advice, but we can give you a good framework. So those one-on-one -on -one discussions can be about budgeting. It can be about your retirement readiness. It could be about how to save. It could be a, about a, a, a myriad of topics, but it is about how to get you focused on what may get you to that retirement goal. And many people do find that they actually can. Yeah. They just haven't taken the look and the and dived into the numbers, which is always daunting. And is the is that I mean, is the fear very common that you people, Oh absolutely. So it's nothing to feel ashamed about if you're scared about oh, talking no. about it. And there's no people also feel a tremendous amount of guilt. Mm -hmm. Um, that they haven't done something or they should be somewhere where I should have been here and, and I'm not. So there's a lot of guilt. I mean, money is a very emotional topic. The popular press always talks about it in a very tactical way and that you should be doing this or that. But this is very, very um, personal. And so your retirement journey or your saving for that retirement journey is only yours. And so there is no judgment, especially if you come and talk to us, there is no judgment of where you should be. Absolutely. So Grace is one of the resources we have, but there's, we offer a ton of them. Mm -hmm. Can you talk us through some of what we, 
provide yeah. our, our clients? Yeah, there's also lots of studies that show if you use, and it doesn't have to be ours, but we have a great one. It's called the Plan Ahead Calculator. And it looks at your exactly that, retirement readiness. Um, it is not difficult to use. If you're very close to retirement, we have one that's called the Retirement Spending Calculator. But anytime you start to use these calculators, it helps you get a little bit closer to your goal. And there are studies that show that. And if um, you're on the Fidelity site, Fidelity also has uh, financial calculators that take into account your actual investment mix. There's also the one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussions that are year-round um, that you can schedule with myself or my two um, colleagues. Um, in terms of benefit education, IBAMS uh, works with the parishes and diocesan staff to help educate on um, benefits. We also have our own uh, client services area to help you with that. We also have a whole education and wellness learning center. And this has all kinds of topics, debt, um, how do I look at an auto loan? Um, what's the difference between a stock and a bond? Very basic information and also some more advanced information. And we have it in text format as well as courses. We have one on social security. Mm -hmm. We have one on health benefits, visioning. Uh, what is um, your defined contribution plan and how do you use it? So all these things are available for you to use 24-7. Right. So we, ha we are hearing a need from our clients, from our lay employees through this study. And we have a lot of these resources and we really want to try to bridge that gap between there's this big scary financial monster in front of me that I don't want to grapple with to, well, I use the plan ahead calculator and I talked to Grace and now this feels like a smaller problem. And so we're really looking to bridge that gap that somehow is occurring where the connections kind of not made between us and our clients for these resources. So I just want to say here that uh, we know that there is this gap, that um, you have a relationship with us as an employee, employer, uh, and that you don't really look to us um, for that personal um, information or information gathering. And we are making um, strides to make the information that we put on the web or that we send by mail or email much more um, friendly, conversational, trying to use um, imagery that makes more sense, that you don't have to spend a lot of time digesting. All of our information is in nugget form so that to help you feel that you have enough time. That's another thing that people always say, that they don't have enough time to learn. So our information is um, small nuggets. We also are, um, it is financial literacy month. So this mm -hmm. is a great time to, if you wanna brush up on some of the information that you already know, um, please feel free to give us a call and schedule that. Um, there are prizes for doing some of those uh, tasks. Um, remember that the, we are also thinking about other ways to get information to you. Um, looking at podcasts and other ways, webinars that we have now, so that you can look at this at any time. Um, sometimes people know what they want to do, but they just need the validation to go ahead. We are happy to do that for you if you're working with someone. If you're working with your spouse, we'd be happy to help you with that as well. Mm -hmm. So please, we want to help you and be part of your team. Well. So that said, we're in this together. We're here if you want to reach out. Yep. Yeah, um, I, if you have any more questions about the research, then please don't hesitate to contact, contact Anne and I. But more importantly, um, please do reach out to Grace and um, 
and, and talk to her or any of her colleagues in education and wellness. And do look out to see um, if we are coming to your diocese. Um, we know that there have been, um, you know, if there's enough interest and there's a, a planning for wellness for clergy, there can also be one for lay employees. Um, and, you know, if you, if you hear about that um, through your diocese, or I believe you can look on our website. Absolutely. And find out if website. we're coming close to you, maybe not if it's you know if if it's if you're lo located close to another diocese you may have the opportunity you don't doesn't actually have to be in your diocese if you're proximate to another one to attend one of these planning for wellness events and uh, we would love to have you there absolutely so thank you so much for listening in and um yeah we look forward to seeing with you seeing you speaking with you in the very near future thanks so much Thank you. Bye-bye.